the Deputy Minister of the Economy from Belarus. <laughs> Mrs. Madina Avila Kasimova, Deputy Governor of the National Bank of, of Kazakhstan. <laughs> Mr. Mrs. Tatiana Ivanisichina, State Secretary from the Ministry of Finance in Moldova. <laughs> and Mr. Bahram Ashraf Hanov, Deputy Minister of Finance from Uzbekistan. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for being part of this panel. We will uh, have um, um, uh, an informal conversation about many issues that uh, we, are being we have been discussing in more general terms during the opening session. And I would like to start by uh, doing two things. First, I will share um, uh, a story from my region from uh, Latin America and the Caribbean of a small country in terms of population that has managed to escape um, the middle income trap. So this is a country that has three million people but has managed in a very productive way in the last 15 years to produce food for 28 million people and has based the growth model in exporting that surplus. Through that process, they have managed to reduce poverty, in the case of extreme poverty, basically to eliminate, eradicate extreme poverty, but they still have uh, moderate poverty levels of, you know, around, in terms of monetary poverty of around. Uh, through, two years ago, they were um, uh, now, um, uh, you know, positioned in the high income country status. And one can think of that very successful story as one in which, you know, these development challenges that we discuss through the SDGs become less relevant, and maybe even the role for an organization like UNDP being less important, as many, many people would argue. Well, I was just there last week, and I can tell you that the government is really demanding an engagement from UNDP because they are facing very important challenges, even as a high-income country. Two, two examples. One is that if they continue that process of high productivity, they are facing limitations in terms of one of the inputs, land. And in order to make land more productive, 93% of the whole land in Uruguay is now being used for agricultural production. They are facing issues related to land quality, issues related to water quality, issues related to people being expelled from rural sector to urban areas in which there are pockets of exclusion, the need for prov provision of services in the urban sector, and they have to do this in the context of a relatively limited fiscal space. So even a high-income country and a very successful one like this is facing the challenges of the Sustainable Development Goals, and that's why it's so important to acknowledge that these, these sustainable development goals are a challenge in every context. And that's why we are here today, to understand how we can face these challenges and uh, get on the, on the path to achieving the SDGs successfully. I just wanted to give two, two pieces of information in these in this graphs and then open for the conversation. First is that as middle income and high income countries, we still have a problem of domestic resource mobilization in the sense that tax revenue in many of our countries is still limited. So you can see here the comparison in which uh, low income uh, countries, lower middle income and even upper middle income countries have still a lot of space to improve in terms of uh, uh, tax collection. But as we all know, the political economy of this is not so simple. Second fact is that there is large heterogeneity in terms of indebtedness, but uh, some of our countries in the region are at levels of debt with respect to GDP, where you know, the space to continue financing development through debt is becoming more limited. This is certainly the case in the story I told you about Uruguay, where the level of debt with respect to GDP is close to 70%. So the, the channels uh, to uh, finance development are being more limited, but also the incidence of how those resources are used also matter. 
So in developing new, new instruments, we have to think not only in terms of the scale of the financing, but also the incidence of that financing. This is an example of, this is what well, you see there is a change in the Gini coefficient for the distribution of income for many countries in the region uh, uh, where I work in Latin America and the Caribbean compared to the change in the Gini coefficient in the EU, European Union and the US before and after fiscal redistribution. So as you can see in my region, even though some countries manage to redistribute more, still the fiscal system has a limited capacity for redistribution. So we're facing these challenges of achieving the SDGs as it was uh, discussed this, uh, in, the session, in the opening session this morning. In a context we, we need to be more creative and we need innovation in terms of the instruments, the channels and the sources of financing. Uh, in order to continue on the, on the path to the achievement of the SDGs. So that's what we are here, uh, what, what we want to discuss here, and we have um, views from very different contexts to try to learn from each other um, and come up with some ideas on the way forward. So I would like to first open a session uh, uh, with, uh, with our panelists to try to face, uh, you know, to start addressing some of the, of the questions. I, we are posing here three questions, but there are many others. Uh, so one is basically the idea of how the long-term financing has, been, uh, has to be managed in terms of the trade-off with the short-term financing needs. The other has to do with or the leakages in the system, like as it was mentioned also this morning, because sometimes you know illicit financial funds uh, 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 flows, sorry, and uh, uh, tax evasion and so on are leakages in the system that made it uh, more difficult to be, to be effective. And the other is this idea of how we can find new instruments, be innovative, be creative, and as uh, the administrator, Achim Steiner, said, the, the problem is not the availability of funding. The problem is how to find the right governance, the right instruments, the right regulations, and how to match uh, supply and demand. So I will start from my left, and I will give first the floor to our panelists to give a, 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 I ask you to be briefed for a first round of uh, uh, comments, and then we will open uh, for, a, for a conversation. Uh, so, so please, uh, 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 Deputy Minister Sorensen. Should be. Okay. I hope so. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's definitely a pleasure to be here uh, today uh, among colleagues, uh, among partners. Um, it, it's really very important for me to be here uh, today. Uh, when it comes to sustainable development goals, sustainable development goals are definitely very high uh, in the agenda of the Albanian government. We have shown a commitment starting in September 2015 for our work toward integrating sustainable development goals into our national development policy uh, framework. Uh, we have established an interministerial committee and an interinstitutional working group in 2017, uh, as well as we have prepared a uh, baseline report against the, as to where we stand vis-a-vis -vis the SDG indicators in 2018. We submitted for the first time the voluntary uh, report at the UN High Level Political Forum on Sustainable uh, Development. Um, it is very important to, to underline the fact that uh, at, at least at the policy level, we have set it very high in the agenda. Uh, today, we have uh, roughly 83% of the SDG uh, targets. They are already aligned to our national strategy for development and integration, and we as the Ministry of Finance are one of the leading ministries that has the greatest impact on, in our case, 43 different indicators that directly relate to the, uh, to the SDGs. In Albania, we have a particular setting where the Ministry of Finance is not only responsible for finance, but is also for economic development, as well as for all labor and skills development related issues. They are under one uh, portfolio. 
Um, even though we have it very high on the political agenda, uh, that is obviously not, uh, not sufficient. It is very important that we assign the appropriate institutional and human resources that are needed in order to, uh, to reach the sustainable development goals. In terms of, we have been doing an exercise, which has been an important exercise to see as to how our budget contributes to the uh, SDGs. Uh, we did that exercise with the support of uh, UNDP. Um, and we saw that uh, roughly 61% uh, of the central government spending uh, for 2015 to 2017 budget can be directly classified as financing toward national SDG uh, achievement. Um, we have also been looking at what are the SDGs that we are financing the most, and definitely it is SDG 10, SDG, the one that has the most, uh, roughly 15% of the total SDG funding goes to SDG 10, but as well as goal 3, 4, and 9 on healthcare, lifelong learning, and infrastructure that take a significant portion of the budget. Nonetheless, having said that, there is definitely a need for uh, prioritizing our interventions, particularly in light of a very limited fiscal space. We are in one of those countries that, again, we are very close to that 70% mark of public debt, therefore it's of utmost importance that there is some prioritizing going on, as well as leveraging the support of the private sector, which we need to do uh, a lot more than we have done in the past. I would like to take two different examples of what we have been doing together with the support of UNDP. Uh, more recently, when it comes to the establishment of something that we call an, a social employment fund, where we have the private sector contributing with a certain percentage of funding toward the employment and skills uh, upgrading of people with disability. Likewise, we have also attempted when it comes to social housing as another area that is very important where we are also leveraging the support of the private sector by introducing a 3% um, a requirement for all private sector uh, construction companies that are building uh, in the country to allocate 3% of the construction space specifically to the housing of people that are uh, in need. These are two tiny uh, measures that we are undertaking but are examples of how we leverage on the private sector to be uh, more involved in the financing uh, of SDGs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I just want to say as well that uh, as people are engaging with uh, this conversation by, uh, you know, through social media, we will later also hear from people who are not in this room but are, are also engaging in this conversation what are some of the questions and, and uh, comments that they have. Um, Deputy Minister Matusevich, uh, you have gone, you know, Belarus uh, has gone through a very impressive uh, process of growth and poverty reduction, but then now they're facing new types of challenges. So we would like to hear from you as well. Mr. Chairman, distinguished colleague, I'd like to share the experience of Belarus beginning with the second question, the system of management. Currently, the Republic of Belarus um, is actually determined to fulfill the, the uh, SDGs, uh, and, but this process should also um, be reflected in the strategic documents. And these documents should be adopted and uh, dealt with at the high level. In the first quarter of this year, we developed a contact. I can't hear what she's saying. The well, you know what we will do, if you don't mind, uh, Deputy Minister, we will go to, um, uh, to the, the next speaker. Is yes. that okay? And then we'll come back. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sorry about that. So, Deputy uh, Governor uh, from Kazakhstan, um, also a country that has gone through an uh, impressive uh, growth and strengthening of the middle class, but still facing uh, new challenges. Uh, so, we would like to hear from you as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, let me take this opportunity to greet all the participants of uh, uh, Istanbul Development Dialogue. It's truly become a platform for policymakers, international organizations to discuss on the most pressing issues. And I would like also to take this opportunity to thank the government of Turkey and uh, UNDP for organizing this event. 
Uh, Kazakhstan just uh, a few days ago had the first forum on sustainable development goals and uh, with the support of uh, UN offices in uh, Kazakhstan we set up a national mechanism uh, where, where we nationalized uh, the goals and the indicators of SDGs. Uh, there is an institutional structure that has been put in place uh, with a steering committee led by the Prime Minister uh, of Kazakhstan and we have created five working groups uh, on each uh, which uh, on all the SDG goals. Five working groups called People, Planet, Peace, Partnership and Wellbeing where not only government officials, not only each, each group is headed by the Minister but not only government officials but uh, most importantly, uh, NGOs, uh, civil society representatives, private sector are included in the working groups. Uh, we, with the support based on the UN methodology, we um, made a comprehensive assessment of Kazakhstan's capacities to implement and monitor SDGs. And we revealed a fairly high degree of integration of SDG targets in our national plans and programs. So about 61% of SDG targets are currently included in our national strategic and program documents. But that's uh, definitely not enough. Uh, today, I think the, the topic of this discussion, development finance, and how do we finance a sustainable development, and how uh, we allocate budget resources, how do we attract private uh, investment uh, in order to support the achievement of SDG goals. I think this is a new agenda. And uh, to, 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 to say, frankly, uh, this is something where we need uh, most to work on. So um, the challenge is not only really identifying the indicators and targets uh, for, sus uh, for sustainable development based on the level of economic development of the country. In Kazakhstan what we saw is that uh, most of the targets um, like uh, on, across all the 17 goals uh, we can say that uh, we have achieved uh, to the minimum extent but um, at the same time, we are putting uh, a high uh, standard uh, for ourselves. So, uh, the long-term strategic goal of Kazakhstan is to be among 30 most developed nations of the world. So, we are currently working closely with uh, OECD on um, implementing the best standards of OECD countries in Kazakhstan. We did achieve uh, certain results, just to give you a few numbers. So, we started since gaining our independence in 1991. We started with GDP per capita of $300, and now it's about $10,000, um, so it's in real terms, not on purchasing power parity. So uh, the economic growth, we've been able to really uh, translate the economic growth in uh, improvement of well-being of people. So if you look at human development indicators in Kazakhstan, um, uh, there is, a, there is a, a big improvement, but one comprehensive indicator is life expectancy. So uh, the life expectancy increased by nine uh, years to 73 years, uh, but also the level of poverty decreased from 35% uh, to 4.7% um, as of result of the last year. Uh, so, uh, once we put uh, some ambitious targets and uh, numeric indicators of SDG and nationalize them in your country, then of course, this, how do you finance it? Um, I think the, uh, the discussion, uh, like comprehensive discussion in a way that uh, Mr. Steiner put today in his uh, keynote speech is not yet uh, present uh, in a country, but many actions uh, been taken. Uh, in, uh, in that direction. So if you look at, uh, at our budget, so we, uh, about 40% of our budget is uh, uh, devoted to investment in human capital, so it's education, um, healthcare system, social uh, assistance and transfers. Um, there is growing, um, uh, there is allocation of resources to different infrastructure pro uh, projects, but at the same time, Kazakhstan being an uh, oil dependent country, uh, which is the country rich in oil resources. So I, I think there is a, also a big debate going on. How do you uh, uh, make sure that you sustain economic growth since the economy is uh, dependent on uh, oil uh, extraction and uh, export and uh, at the same time uh, try to invest more in um, alternative energy. So. With that in mind, we adopted the concept of uh, green economy where we clearly set a target that 50% of our uh, 
um, um, energy should be produced from alternative sources by 2050. And we have also a clear target for 2030 where uh, we plan to achieve about 13% coming from uh, wind, uh, power um, and um, water, including water um, and solar, solar power. Um, do we do we measure our budget uh, expenditures um, based on the uh, achievement of SDGs? Probably not yet. Uh, this is, I think, the uh, extremely necessary exercise that we need to do. Mm -hmm. uh, from the point of view of the National Bank, uh, just a few few more remarks. Uh, we believe, uh, at the we at the National Bank believe that price stability is the most powerful tool and the most powerful contribution that the central banks can do to the economic growth and to more sustainable economic growth. It creates a predictable environment for businesses and also uh, better allocates resources in the economy where uh, citizens don't have to worry about the uh, cost of their money and can make better uh, decisions uh, about allocation of their resources. It's also very important for uh, bringing foreign direct investment and credit growth in the economy. Uh, financial stability is also uh, extremely important. And uh, to share our experience, we, we had a certain uh, after the, uh, problems after the world financial crisis in 2008 with lots of NPLs on the balance sheets of the banks. We've been able to uh, uh, really clear the balance sheets so the NPLs are about 8% uh, currently of the assets of, in the banking sector. But uh, is it enough? Just price stability and financial stability, while they are the most powerful tools, probably it's not enough. So we can do more. So what we are doing is uh, we uh, initiated a number of special programs together with the government. Uh, the long-term financing program for uh, businesses in uh, manufacturing industries or, and in industries which are not related to the oil and gas extraction. So this is a big, uh, like uh, almost uh, two billion dollar uh, long-term financing that we are providing to commercial banks and commercial banks on the market rates. They are providing it to the uh, businesses. Uh, it is uh, the interest rate is partly subsidized by the government. So the uh, final interest rate would be about seven to eight percent for the for for the businesses, um, and. Um, uh, this, I believe it's a part also of the, our answer to sustainable development and diversification of our economy away from uh, natural resources. Uh, another uh, programs that we have is um, the, on the government side is a program uh, business roadmap. It's uh, devoted to support uh, SME uh, in economy and uh, SME of course it's uh, uh, the priority for any country, for any developing country, since it's create uh, enormous opportunities for employment, for income growth of the people. And uh, while each country has their own experience on SME support, Kazakhstan since 2010 um, uh, been uh, uh, implementing this program. Uh, it provides three key instruments of support. It's uh, subsidizing of uh, interest rates. So it was uh, very important uh, for Kazakhstan while we were uh, exiting from the financial crisis and the interest rates were really high uh, domestically. So uh, s second is the guarantees for new startups who don't have a mortgage or assets you know, or collateral to get the credit. And uh, the third dimension is uh, we invest in missing infrastructure. So the small businesses, who are in need of uh, certain infrastructure to re really to lower the capital costs? We provide such financing from the government. Uh, from the government, uh, al also, uh, also I would um, uh, just add um, the the last point is that uh, just uh, going back to your uh, introductory remarks on um, um, tax revenues. Uh, so. The, the experience of Kazakhstan was that we, uh, inter we lowered our tax rates mm. throughout the economy for physical persons, for businesses. They are probably the lowest in the, among former CIS countries. And if you look at, if you compare to Eastern European countries, probably they are the, most lo uh, the, the lowest one. 
So uh, corporate income tax is 20 percent. It's for large businesses, but for small and medium enterprises, individual entrepreneurs, it's from two to three percent, depending on the license that they get. Uh, the idea was that once you enlarge the um, tax base through creation and stimulating the growth of SMEs, uh, your tax revenues would be still high. However, uh, I think one, this is again a, a choice that you need to make in your economy, whether you support the income of your uh, population and create uh, really uh, conditions for the development of new SMEs and individual entrepreneurs, or you tax them or you tax them uh, with uh, high tax rates. For physical persons, the, the personal income tax is currently only 10%, which is like the lowest in the world. Uh, so I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, very good. I think you talk about uh, diversification of the economy, diversification of the, uh, or, or uh, restructuring, let's say, of the, of the energy matrix. And at the end, you are also uh, getting into the details of some instruments to bring more private uh, financing into, into the economy, which is something that uh, also uh, uh, Belarus has been discussing for a while, how to reform the state-owned enterprises and bring more private uh, investment in a, in a way that is consistent with the Belarus development model. So I would like to go back to uh, Deputy Minister Matusevich uh, um, uh, to, to look into this, uh, this particular experience. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dear colleagues, <clears throat> well, I apologize. My English is not so good, so I prefer to speak Russian. <clears throat> I'd like to say that Belarus, from the point of view of management and administration and implementation of uh, the economy of the country, uh, has been working with a certain measure of success. And I would like to present to you the, our economic bulletin uh, for the first uh, quarter of this year, it, uh, it carries the concept of uh, economic development until 2035. I'd like to um, uh, quote uh, from this document. It says here directly that for Belarus, the, the join, joining of national um, the goals with, this, uh, with, the, uh, S, uh, with the SDGs is a priority, especially in the light of the long term development of our republic. What I mean to say is that uh, uh, currently we've been introducing the SDGs uh, into the economy of the country. At the next uh, lower level, now we have already start, uh, start, uh, pay, in, involved this uh, and included this in the national uh, uh, program. This is a very um, uh, rather delicate and painful process for the national uh, users of the budget of the state programs because we force them to to de determine the uh, uh, target uh, uh, target metrics. And um, these um, uh, metrics should be aligned with the um, uh, with the, um, the goals that uh, uh, our investment projects are aimed there, with a view to improving the general uh, the general indicator economic indicators of the country. So we, our country is uh, that of a high de, um, development of the human uh, um, component of uh, the uh, country. This balance is rather very delicate and uh, subtle. It has already been mentioned, stressed by our colleagues. The uh, SDGs actually implied uh, the um, uh, long-term results uh, um, uh, uh, where the question is, what are we going to leave to the, few, to the generations to come? But here, the most important thing that the, uh, the, some, there are some political issues that need to be financed today, and in this context, we uh, should see to it that there should be um, um, affordable uh, uh, financing uh, for uh, so this financing could be, you know, a structure should be uh, um, uh, smoothly financed. What I mean to say that over the last few years we discovered in Belarus in good cooperation with the international um, uh, financial uh, organizations 
here we have got we have a lot of projects with the global uh, ecological fund how the financing is done i'll say i'll tell you that this money is we channel let's say uh, um, to, for the development of our forestry we have uh, our forestry is rather world famous but in the center of europe we feel that our uh, forests are now uh, uh, in jeopardy because there are a lot a lot of uh, um, um, uh, mites and uh, microorganisms that uh, d destroy our uh, forests last year we uh, we uh, uh, printed out uh, the document which highlights our our in, uh, cooperation with the international financial organizations and we invited uh, some fi more financing for this so there are also some projects in the sphere of uh, water management uh, uh, and here, that, that brings us to a very interesting point. This is also a long-term financing, and it's very good that there are such funds as FIP, for example, uh, which, uh, uh, if the country uh, enters this uh, uh, country, uh, it will attract the uh, credit. Yeah, I mean EBRD, and uh, we can organize a more efficient uh, um, up-to-date uh, program and sorry if we contribute one million uh, billion um, uh, euros to the into this project after this we we, um, we saw that uh, the situation in disposing with the uh, um, hard waste has been greatly uh, impressively improved that actually is, uh, attracted and uh, added a, um, a good philip added philip to the activities of our other ministries as far as the green bonds are concerned, in our current plans, there are issues um, um, that deal with that thing, and the Ministry of uh, the Finances of the Minister of Finance of Belarus, jointly with the World Bank, we see that we have got uh, cheaper sources than the green bonds. So this is a mechanism that should be used in the future. So to sum up, I would like to thank. Uh, and uh, UNDP, not only for this uh, forum, but for the fact that UNDP actually is one of the uh, leaders of promoting the uh, SDGs policy in Belarus. Uh, it was owing to the uh, UNDP that we have got uh, um, the, the, the uh, promotion of uh, um, uh, the new projects, and there is uh, um, there are large-scale projects. Um, so that this project should be sustainable and uh, not volatile, the Minister, Minister of Economy uh, always insists that there should be co-financing. And they, stre they stress that uh, uh, business should be interested in the formation of a sustainable financial and economical model. Uh, understandably, there may be some preferences, additional grants, etc., that actually exist. But rather, social economic country, in our view, should uh, be sustainable from a commercial point of view, with your account of the, the ecological aspects. This is, the, I think, a, ta a task that each government should take uh, up and uh, consider. Thank you. Secretary Ivan Ficina um, from Moldova. Uh, we see um, in Moldova, we have seen examples of innovation that are, um, at least from my region, we have learned a lot from what has, happening, well, what has happened in, in, in Moldova. So we would like to hear uh, from you. Thank you very much. And uh, to start with, I would like to give you the perspective of the Ministry of Finance. Since at the Ministry of Finance, I am responsible for budget planning, and we started to think seriously about financing the SDGs only recently. So our uh, state chancellery, which is uh, the office under the prime minister, they developed the national development strategy, Moldova 2030. And it was preceded by another development strategy, Moldova 2020, which didn't reach 
most of its goals, but it was a lesson learned. And the most important lessons that we learned is that coordination among institutions is so important. Uh, because in our case, the state chancellery was responsible for drafting the national development strategies and national development plans. And we at the Ministry of Finance, we left the job of prioritizing budget allocations to the line ministries. So because there are so many financing needs in so many areas, we consider that the line ministries know best where they would need the budget allocations to be directed. Uh, but uh, this was not, not the case because most of the times the line ministries had a short, short sighted vision and the strategic goals were not reached. Uh, and this is an uh, important issue because in Moldova we still take budget planning decisions based on line budgeting. We tried to implement the program-based budgeting a couple of years ago, and it was successful in terms of budget uh, implementation. For budget execution, we would know what are the, the results reached. But when getting back to budget planning, uh, the decision makers as well as the members of the parliament still preferred the old-fashioned line, line budgeting. Uh, so building on that, uh, starting with 2018, the Minister of Finance decided to take a leading role in the financing of the strategic goals. And in 2018 budget planning exercise, when the line ministries came to the Ministry of Finance to budget consultations, we would ask them the questions like, how are your um, priorities met? and how are they linked to the um, strategic goals. And when we started to ask them these questions, they also got um, awareness was built among the line ministries that they should focus more on a forward-looking perspective. Also because our Moldova 2030 uh, National Development Strategy, which builds on the SDGs and uh, presents 10 priorities, but these priorities are quite broad, and we realized that until we implement the fully functioning result-based budgeting, it would be best to separate some priority sector and to allocate more budget resources to those ones, instead of cutting the budget cake equally among all the 10 priorities, which ensured that none of the large reforms were implemented or met. So in 2018, the budget allocations were uh, prioritized towards three sectors, and these are the road and railway infrastructure, education, and strengthening the rule of law. Also, 2018 is the first year when a large infrastructure project was implemented from domestic resources. Because until 2018, all the infrastructure projects were financed by IFIs and by our external creditors. Uh, so almost 4% of our expenditures, budget expenditures in 2018 have been allocated to a large uh, uh, road, local road uh, reconstruction project, which proved to be very successful. And we decided to continue with this approach of focusing our attention and resources to a limited number of priority sectors and gradually trying to implement the result-based budgeting and to rotate the sectors where our attention and budget allocations would be uh, directed. Well, so far, these are the challenges that we are facing. And uh, uh, I hope that with the help of our donor community and especially the UNDP and other UN agencies, we would be able to fully implement the result-based budgeting and then we would have proper and tangible results in terms of the financing of ASDGs. Thank you. Um, and then to finalize this first round, uh, Deputy Minister Ashraf Hanov, uh, you come from a country that has engaged in a very ambitious program of reforms in the last years. Uh, Uzbekistan, so we would like to hear uh, also from your experience. Thank you, Chairman. Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude on behalf of Uzbek delegation who are present here for invitation to this uh, 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 excellently organized forum IDD. 
and we are very happy to be here because uh, we already, from the, since morning, we are already learning and exploring the opportunities and new options for the new options of financing. And we, uh, we had a chance to, to listen to um, Akim Steiner and, and we got new ideas. And this platform is very, I think, the, one of the best platforms where we can talk about the uh, implementation of SDGs on a national level and to uh, adapt it to uh, local ownership. And I would like to use, to use this opportunity to uh, briefly describe our SDG nationalization process and outline a flagship uh, a program uh, demonstrating my government's uh, strong commitment to uh, integrated and people-centered uh, SDG achievement at local level. Uh, six months ago, uh, in, uh, in October 2018, just on the eve of the UN Day, Uzbekistan adopted 16 uh, SDGs, uh, goals, and, and 125 targets, as well as a roadmap of implementation of SD, national SDGs. Why we accepted, adopted 16, not 17? Just because SDG 14, you know, it's a life under water and ocean, oceans. And since Uzbekistan is a double land rock country, uh, we couldn't physically adopt this uh, SDG 14. So uh, we adopted all the other uh, 16 uh, uh, SDGs. And in working out and finalizing these SDG, SDGs and uh, finalizing the all 125 targets, uh, UN played a critically, uh, adv critical advisory role in nationalization of this process. Um, including through this UN World Bank MAPS mission, which were held in April 2018. So uh, two months ago, uh, just in March of this year, Uzbekistan uh, worked out uh, 206 indicators, uh, national indicators, and they were finalized and endorsed by the uh, National SDG uh, Coordination Council. Uh, Available data on these national SDGs were published on the newly uh, set SDG website portal. I would like to stress out that the all, uh, almost all uh, and national uh, targets and indicators are aligned with the global SDG indicators. As per the roadmap, uh, this uh, government committed to incorporate all these uh, good targets and goals with the national programs and strategies. And uh, while state budget, uh, state budget will be the key source of financing, uh, now Uzbekistan government is trying to integrate it into uh, formulation, drafting, and consideration of the state budget. But as Akim Steiner told that the public funds are not sufficient enough to uh, achieve all the SDGs, national SDGs. So we are taking uh, note of that, and I believe uh, that there are much larger opportunities uh, to uh, of financing opportunities to mobilize private sector and to uh, direct ODA uh, to guide ODA, ODA in the right directions. So we are at this point we are working closely with all the IFIs. Uh, World Bank, I, 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 Asian Development Bank, Islamic Development Bank, AIB, AIB, uh, uh, and all other, and EBRD opened, reopened its office in Uzbekistan. So we are working with all the IFIs and will be also guiding them uh, in the right direction to uh, the uh, imp implementation and achievement of the national SDGs. Uh, however, identifying, identifying the uh, effective financing of SDGs uh, strategies requires a good analysis uh, in a, uh, of a financing landscape in our country. Uh, at this point, we are working on a five-year action strategy set in Uzbekistan uh, for the years 2017 and 2021 initiated by uh, President uh, Shavkat Mirziyoyev. And I would like to stress out that the implementation of the agenda, 2030 agenda in Uzbekistan, 
coincided with the introduction of this ambitious and uh, uh, comprehensive five-year strategy plan. Uh, as confirmed by all the stakeholders, uh, there is a great deal of convergence between the SDGs and the Uzbekistan Action Strategy for five years, which has just facilitated national ownership. I would like to talk about the uh, principle of leaving no one behind, which also resonates with the national terms and national uh, reform agenda. And we all know that the achieving, achieving uh, SDG requires uh, the integration into uh, programs and policies uh, on the need, focusing on the needs of those uh, who are uh, vulnerable, vulnerable part of the population, including those who are living in a rural areas and remote areas in line with this uh, principle Uzbekistan uh, just in Uzbekistan recently established uh, UN multi-partner human security trust fund uh, for the Aral Sea region in Uzbekistan and this uh, fund uh, aims to catalyze and strengthening the uh, multi-sectoral and people-centered uh, response to address consequences, consequences of one of the most greatest uh, human-made environmental disasters in the region. You know that the RLC is drying up, so uh, most of the area of the RLC is dried. So this fund uh, provides coherent strategy to uh, coordinate eight flows uh, through uh, single and result-based and uh, evidence-driven programmatic framework. Uh, the fund is aligned with the, with the, uh, with the uh, Busan development uh, principles of four principles, which is uh, a local ownership, focus on results, uh, partnership of development partners, and transparency of aid. I would like to call on, on uh, all development partners and friends to extend their support to this uh, RLC multi-partner trust fund. Using this opportunity, I would like to uh, also invite UN system and UNDP in particular to uh, help us uh, analyze uh, the financial uh, development and trends in Uzbekistan and to find out the new opportunities for financing. Uh, we firmly believe that both uh, the traditional and innovative methods and options like uh, green bonds or social bonds or uh, climate bonds, uh, they should be and need to be explored in Uzbekistan. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it has been a very rich uh, first round of conversation. Give, give an applause to the, the panelists. I think, um, so as we think of the, go this is panelists about the gover government's perspective and uh, I was, uh, in a way, um, the, the three aspects that uh, 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 were mentioned in the case of Moldova, the, the railways, the education and rule of law, in a way summarize some of the constraints that uh, countries face when trying to attract uh, private investment. Basically, one is the connectivity, the other is the skills mismatch, that sometimes is a constraint for investment to, uh, to actually realize. And the other is a governance issue, the, the rule of law and the quality of the, of the justice system and so on. So I wanted to continue this conversation but asking you know, from the government perspective, when we think of different ways of financing, as we move up in the income uh, uh, classification, the traditional sources of funding become less uh, available. So we have to be more creative, more innovative, and rely perhaps more on private sector. So I would like to ask, uh, from your perspective, um, and maybe leave it open for whoever wants to take this uh, uh, opportunity to share your experience, what are the main constraints that you see as uh, the most binding constraints that you see for private sectors to actually uh, be able to uh, uh, become a, an important actor in the financing of, of the SDGs? Maybe share one of the specific experience in the case of your countries. Would you like to? Would you like to? Yeah. 
Yeah, as per uh, private sector. Yes, uh, our, our Kazakhstan uh, colleague told that, that uh, there is a much, uh, uh, there is a good deal of options for the uh, for mobilizing the private sector through giving the stimulation to through uh, uh, downsizing the tax uh, uh, tax uh, system and taxation uh, rates. So in Uzbekistan, we're also uh, trying to find out uh, the ways how to. Uh, save money for the private sector so they can be invest they can they could be invested in this uh, uh, SDG or, uh, the SDGs in, in beginning this year we uh, uh, now changed the tax concept and also we are in the process of uh, changing it in further uh, tax uh, concept we changed not only the uh, uh, direct uh, uh, direct uh, ta taxation taxes taxes but also indirect taxation uh, so we would uh, uh, give the uh, we expand the tax base, tax base. So uh, private sector, we would like to uh, mobilize private sector to into uh, the through the tax revenues into this uh, tax, tax taxation. Uh, we had a, uh, like a grayish uh, uh, like black market and a grayish market mm -hmm. before. Right now. Uh, 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 Opening up the uh, uh, opening up the taxation uh, system and expanding the tax uh, tax base and bringing the uh, new taxpayers, uh, we're trying to use uh, we are trying to uh, enlarge the taxation uh, tax revenues into to the budget and the when the drafting and formulation of the drafting and formulation of the budget. We we'll also uh, will be guided by the SDG, SDGs, SDGs. Right now, as uh, our Turkish colleague told, that we are also in a budgeting on a line item, one item, and we don't know exactly where we are uh, uh, spending our monies, our funds, uh, specifically. And for this reason, we have to uh, transform into new programming, into the new budgeting, like program budgeting or result-oriented budgeting, budgeting, and in Uzbekistan we are now transforming to the from one-year budgeting to three-year budgeting. Mm -hmm. So it will be longer terms uh, plan of planning, and uh, this uh, doing this we can uh, 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 solve uh, bigger problems, uh, not only for example through item line item budgeting when we are just funding the salaries and just small. Miscellaneous, uh, miscellaneous uh, expenses, but we are trying to uh, fund the whole programs from the beginning to the end and ask for the results. Ask for the results, and uh, doing the, doing so, uh, we of course will be uh, putting the SDGs now in front of all the uh, budget recipients. So this should uh, provide the explanation and good uh, basis for uh, asking for requesting the budget allocations. And talking the private sector, uh, yes, uh, there could be some kind of problems because we are we so, we're working so far with the taxation and tax revenues, but uh, also we should give some incentives, tax incentives or tax mm -hmm. credits, for example, for those businesses and private sectors who will be who will be also considering uh, achievement SDGs uh, set up in Uzbekistan, and this 125 targets. This is the targets not only for the government itself, for the uh, for the ministries, but SDGs should be also one of the priorities of the private sector. Thank you very much. I think this idea of simplification of the tax system and uh, better alignment in the planning and longer term becomes already a good setting for, for uh, bringing transparency, which as was discussed this morning, uh, private investors don't like uncertainty. And I think this is one way to reduce uh, that uncertainty. But I would like to hear from other people, maybe uh, uh, Kazakhstan or, um, yeah. Oh, and then, should we go first? Yeah, yeah. Kazakhstan. Uh, yes. Sure. So, um, so the issue, as I understand, how do you create a maybe some built-in mechanisms for the private sector to not just bring investment, 
right? N not just uh, any investment, but uh, investment that is sustainable, right? Correct. And that is in line with SDG goals. So I guess this is uh, quite a challenge um, for economy uh, like Kazakhstan. Uh, as I explained, uh, we are still um, uh, rather oil dependent economy, but it's uh, being diversified. So Kazakhstan attracted like, let's say like 300 billion uh, USD dollars of foreign direct investment over the last like 25 years. And annual inflow of FDI is around 20, 23 billion dollars. And we still see the big chunk of this investment going to the uh, oil, gas, mining sectors. Mm -hmm. But then um, the, if you look at the world, uh, supply and demand for energy resources, we still see that there, there, there will be still uh, a lot of uh, dependence on uh, energy produced through um, extraction of uh, oil and use of oil and gas. But uh, so uh, the, the developing country cannot easily give up any investment in uh, natural resources. And uh, the, the issue is how, to, how do you make it more efficient. So, um, uh, what what we see around the world that big companies that are present in Kazakhstan, uh, almost every large uh, transnational company uh, is there, that they also change the the way the conduct of their business. So, a lot depends on the private sector itself. So, big uh, transnational companies um, think, uh, that are operating in Kazakhstan, they, they are changing their business practices. So the, 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 business, uh, the, the business of extracting uh, oil, gas, or in the mining industry, it's becoming more, um, more safe, energy efficient, with less harm for the, um, for the economy and less, uh, um, less emissions. But uh, at the same time, uh, I think it's very important that uh, the country as a nation, it understands that it needs to move away from, uh, from the brown economy and move to a greener economy. And uh, in, in that sense, as I said before, we, we have a clear set target for alternative uh, financing, but we also, uh, I didn't mention on the green bonds, my, everybody uh, said what they're doing in their countries on the green economy we, we also have adopted mm -hmm. the concept on green bonds and mm -hmm. green finance and there is a special uh, vehicles rules uh, that have been developed procedures for the uh, issuance of uh, green bonds uh, in, in kazakhstan uh, so uh, in uh, probably every sector needs to be looked uh, separately. Mm -hmm. So while uh, as a government, government would all, will always have this dilemma of uh, and trade-off between uh, really supporting economic growth through providing more economic opportunities and not just limiting its um, access or to finance or any investment new coming to the country, uh, not really limiting it uh, in order to create a broader growth, economic growth, and uh, at the same time, we, I think this mechanism of SDGs is a way uh, really to uh, think about this built-in mechanisms that would allow to, to, to have uh, businesses change the attitude. There is a lot of pressure also on the international level, um, which is created by organ your organization, yourself, but also uh, the business is also changing the attitude. I would say uh, the pro probably just one more example is uh, how EBRD operates in Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. So European uh, bank um, is, is a large uh, provider of financial resource for Kazakhstan and they become really green and really gender oriented mm -hmm. <laughs> throughout the, the uh, last few years and what we see is that uh, they, they do uh, introduce this criteria in, in their financing. And uh, they've been uh, supporting us in uh, modernizing the infrastructure for com communal services, which is really important for energy efficiency and energy saving, uh, but also special programs in oil, uh, in mining industries, on um, where they bring any investment based on the specific criteria, which, are, which relates clearly relates to sustainable uh, development. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Minister Sorensen. I just, I just wanted to 
um, highlight the fact that very often when we talk about uh, private sector engagement uh, in anything, um, the response, especially when you are in dialogue with the private sector, very often the response is, let's look at the tax base, let's look at, let's reduce um, taxes as an incentive for the private sector to, uh, to cooperate. In small countries like Albania, where the fiscal space is not there and we don't have the luxury to keep uh, cutting uh, taxes really. I think it is very important to look at other bottlenecks in the economy that can unleash the potential of the private sector and to look at those areas where there is ample space to build a business case why the private sector uh, needs to participate. Um, I will take one specific example because it's closer to the area that I directly uh, cover that has to do with uh, employment and skills, uh, skills development. Um, talking about having the private sector invest in skills development maybe 15, 20 years ago, it was unheard of. Um, but today we have a private sector that contributes significantly when it comes to, set, uh, to uh, skills development uh, in the country, particularly through our vocational education and training uh, in the country. As the private sector has progressed, as the private sector is growing and becoming more consolidated, their capacity to contribute has uh, increased and they don't necessarily always have to contribute through direct financial means. For instance, the private sector in Albania is significantly contributing currently in providing work-based learning. And that is simply because there is a vested interest and there is uh, a business case for the private sector that is feeling the crunch of lack of skilled labor when they have identified a niche where they can themselves contribute for returns that are directly coming back to them. And of course, it's always for the, uh, for the society overall uh, as well. Other elements when it comes to private sector uh, engagement is definitely related to corporate social uh, responsibility and that is something else that has been uh, has been quite uh, on the rise and a third element that I would like to highlight is also the bit that we should also be looking at the private sector as probably sometimes a more efficient entity that can deliver services including uh, public services such as health education etc this, this is also another important area of engaging um, with the private sector uh, looking at the economy as a whole and looking at specific sectors um, in Albania we're looking at we're asking the question what can we do uh, not only as a Ministry of Economy or the Ministry of Finance to unleash the potential of the sector, but we're looking at it as across the government type of uh, approach uh, and goal. So in other words, all the, uh, the line ministries, all the ministries in the country look at what they can specifically do for all those horizontal things <coughs> that are so important for the private sector to, to perform better, but also specifics to, uh, to different sectors. Currently, we have four sectors that are of priority to the government. Uh, one of them is uh, definitely uh, manufacturing. Uh, an, an, another sector is what we call business process outsourcing, which is outsourcing of services to other countries. It could be financial services, it could be legal services, a lot of IT, human resource uh, services, etc. cetera, um, that uh, it, it's an area of big export for growth. And of course, tourism. Um, and uh, agro-processing are sectors for, which of our, for us which are very important and we're engaging with the private sector to identify what are those things that uh, I mean will unleash the potential in these sectors and the answer is despite the first one always being some fiscal incentives that they're interested in the second one and the third one it's really very concrete small things that can unleash uh, the potential of the sectors. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, also interesting that uh, we have been so far um, talking about financing, mainly focused on the financing of the engines of growth. So we're talking about uh, um, you know, opportunities for investment in, in terms of, for example, as you said, going from the brown to the green economy. And in Colombia now they talk about the orange economy. And in, in small development states, we uh, mainly in those countries we talk about the blue economy, which is making the ocean the driver of growth. Um, so in that case, it's um, relatively clear why the private sector would engage, because this could be profitable provided 
you have the right governance and, and the, right, the right instruments. But I'd like to move, and we can even, uh, because there is less experience, not necessarily give examples, but maybe speculate a little bit of what would be uh, your view on the private sector uh, financing uh, aspects more related to the social protection systems. As we know, you know the, the changes in the labor market and so on have changed the relationship between employer, employer and employees. And they are changing also the possibilities to finance the traditional models of social protection as we know them. Uh, so in a, in a few cases uh, in developing countries, more in developed countries, there are cases in which the private sector is actually investing in issues related to social, uh, with social impact. Uh, that's why uh, one of the examples of what the uh, administrator Achim Steiner was referring this morning as social, sorry, as impact investment. So I'd like to hear if there is any experience or how do you see uh, realistically the possibility of the private sector actually also coming to finance not only those large investments for growth, but also investments to have more impact in terms of the household level uh, uh, welfare that is mainly what we, had, we aimed at when we discussed uh, the SDGs. So I would uh, leave it open for any of you who would like to uh, give your views on this. Please. Is it on? Yeah, it's on. Okay, thank you. Uh, so because you mentioned the investments in the social areas, I cannot not mention the uh, Moldova Social Innovation Hub which was a project supported by the UNDP and ran between 2014 and 2018 and was established as a, a multilateral platform to bring together various sectors like the government sector, the private sector, the NGOs, uh, which uh, through communication with, would come up with innovative uh, solutions for uh, some social uh, problems and this was a really successful project and in this way we tried to bring this platform for the private sector to know that there is a platform where their voice is heard and where we see them as reliable partners for, uh, for investment even in social sectors. Thank you, thank you very much. Any other um, comment or um With your kind permission, in Belarus uh, we have uh, always been carrying very actively our policies and uh, up to now uh, uh, many businesses have uh, uh, on their plans the social uh, 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 security problems. We uh, we try our best uh, to uh, free uh, uh, these uh, projects from uh, um, the government uh, uh, care and try to put them under the protection of the uh, uh, private sector. So let's say if there is a, a factory or a, a plant that builds, uh, uh, say, children's recreation, recreation um, uh, area, etc. So these uh, projects, of course, will be uh, given a helping hand. So we uh, attach great importance to the development of sports and uh, health care. It's very important for the society in total. If we uh, consider the human resources just uh, as such, and so we are, we are fighting for that thing, but uh, uh, it's not only a workforce, but many people that constitute this workforce they uh, like to live at home, not abroad. They like to go to uh, have good earnings at home, have good conditions, good social security at home, etc. So Belarus differs from other countries um, in that uh, uh, in that uh, over three uh, thirty years have uh, uh, suffered. Uh, from uh, uh, the, 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 the so we can, we uh, uh, offer help to um, the families with many uh, children. 
Also, if you remember the Chernobyl, we suffer from that uh, too, and there are many families who already uh, live under such conditions, and may give them around help. Uh, you want to go? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, the social investment and the participation of the private sector, I think it's crucial for any country. So government on its own, um, given the limitations of budget, uh, certainly uh, will not be able to finance all the needs. Uh, you mentioned just one area, it's uh, skills development, it's education. Uh, two examples from Kazakhstan from our experience. Uh, in 2013, uh, the level of uh, coverage of children by preschool education was only about 23%. Uh, just uh, a year ago, we almost achieved 95% coverage of, by preschool education of all children in Kazakhstan from age from three to six. We did it by bringing really private sector in the play, in the picture. So what we did is that we introduced the per capita financing and instead of construct, building and constructing kindergartens, which would re really take many years, uh, we really introduced the new uh, PPP mechanisms where we provide uh, per capita financing for every child. And the private sector, they, they just, it just gave a burst for the uh, private-owned uh, kindergartens, development centers, uh, and uh, of course it's a development of SME, it's a growth of income of people, so many job places were created in a very short period of time, so like over this five-year period, we've been able to achieve almost 100% coverage. The same we are currently doing in, uh, at school level. So Kazakhstan is currently in its demographic window of opportunity. The population is uh, increasing rapidly, and uh, we have a still deficit of uh, places in schools. Uh, and uh, we uh, also uh, currently in introducing this um, per capita financing model in schools. Previously, it was like line budget, line budgeting, and uh, was also um, it would also allow to increase the salaries of uh, teachers, which is key to the quality of any school system. And uh, this, at the third level, this uh, what what we did is that um, on a VTA level and higher education level, uh, we currently understand that our system is not uh, well. Um, uh, well uh, suited for the new needs of the new digital economy with uh, rapid industry for zero penetration of all sectors of economy. We see that we need constantly uh, invest in skills upgrade. Uh, it cannot be done by the government itself. We will never be able to follow the trends and develop the education programs for every specialty. It's only the private sector who can do it. So uh, we brought uh, this in front of the private sector and uh, last year um, there was a, a big support from uh, foreign investors, from all private companies in Kazakhstan and we uh, launched uh, uh, based on the experience of uh, large uh, companies, we launched like, training centers, uh, centers of competences mm -hmm. for main key industries of Kazakhstan where they invest they uh, invest and they transfer their knowledge and uh, provide financing for these centers of competence. Kazakhstan, the government on its side, will uh, replicate uh, this experience, uh, the best practices, skills, programs to all other colleges and uh, VTE institutions uh, across the country. That's also just one example from higher education. Thank you. Yes, please. I would like to support yes. Madina on the PPP side because I think the PPP is one of the best models uh, to uh, give up the government's uh, uh, introduction into the branches of economy and leaving the branches economy for the private business and also sharing some of the re uh, uh, revenues with the private sector, involving them and bringing them to uh, um, achieve some SDGs. Uh, in Uzbekistan also, PPP right now, uh, uh, recently, one month ago, the new law was adopted on PPP, and we see the, that the PPP model can help in achieving SDG 1, the poverty fighting, SDG uh, 3, the uh, good health care, and SDG 7 is like a cheap energy for uh, population, 
population. And that's why right now we are working with uh, different IFIs and all, uh, with uh, different international uh, companies and uh, consultants. For example, on healthcare side, we're working with the IFC uh, uh, on uh, bringing uh, private sector to uh, dialysis, to sterilization, and to many uh, uh, areas where government was 100% monopolized uh, its uh, involvement. And right now we're giving up and giving up uh, with giving some incentives to investors and also uh, guaranteeing some minimum uh, uh, revenue or income for them. So uh, giving some incentives to private sector. Uh, uh, not all, only uh, uh, will increase their interest in the sector, but also will give uh, some financial opportunities to invest into the uh, 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 bringing uh, into the uh, making good uh, making good uh, the life for their uh, employee, employees employees uh, and giving the uh, better for example salaries and giving the so some social benefits for, for employees and uh, I think PPP is a good model for that and we'll be uh, working hard on the PPP side on both kindergartens for example like in Kazakhstan also we have for example uh, very low um, uh, coverage of uh, children with a kindergarten. We had a good coverage, for example, in early years, but now, right now we have 38% of all of the children under age seven now uh, covered by the kindergartens. And uh, Uzbekistan already uh, uh, allocated $200 uh, million dollars for the PPP on the kindergartens. So we are giving uh, uh, out the credit, for example, uh, privileged credit lines through commercial banks to private sector so they can build the kindergartens and thus taking the children from the streets, from the house, and giving their mothers to go to work. To work. And right now, uh, our aim is to take this uh, coverage level up to, to 60%. Uh, uh, to the, uh, in 2021, 20, 21, and to uh, uh, level 80% uh, by 2025, mm -hmm. and this would, that would need also uh, that would need uh, a good financing uh, for the PPP, but also uh, involvement of the private sector. Thank you. Let's hear from the Albanian experience. Very, very quickly, uh, very similar to the other examples when it comes. To Вот несколько примеров, когда мы говорим относительно того, как заботу осуществлять о детях. Имеется у нас сеть детских садов, которая охватывает большое количество детского населения. У нас сейчас проводится кампания, направленная на то, чтобы дать женщинам определенные субсидии для, транспор... для... для проезда на транспорте и для того, чтобы они могли освободить свое время для работы, отдав детей в детские сады. Вот э, одна треть населения живет в столице, в, в Тиране. И здесь частный сектор уже, уже делает соответствующие инвестиции в бюджет муниципального органов, в бюджет органов здравоохранения и так далее. Кроме того, еще предприятия сами по себе из своих фондов выделяют определенные деньги для того, чтобы улучшить жизнь своих сотрудников. Хотел бы подчеркнуть, что частный э, сектор уже ощущает на себя благо, благотворные результаты такой э, политики. Они, они сейчас видят, что э, ситуация достигла такого э, уровня, что без дополнительных субсидий для работающих э, в частном секторе этим предприятиям не уцелеть. 
Я не знаю, как, как, как будет этот вопрос решаться, это очень интересный вопрос, было бы интересно. Может быть, есть кто-нибудь, кто хочет? Maybe some questions from the audience. Perfect. We have some friends who can so help us out with some microphones. Let's take three questions and then we'll open for another round. There is one here. Hi, my name is Shams Mustafaeva. I am in the RC office. Я работаю в офисе RC из Азербайджана. Deputy Minister for Moldova, uh, Belarus, sorry. Um, and I'm going to ask it in Russian just to make it easier for everybody, for the presenter. Uh, Mr. Ch uh, Deputy Minister, you said that in your country, how can we learn about this practice? How other minister, ministers followed, followed you, and how did they agree to use this new way of planning? And another question. You said that the Belarus uh, is... Uh, are, are preparing plans for 2035. Does it mean that you are pessimistic that you won't be man you won't manage to 2030, or does it mean that you won't stop until you are sure to have reached it? Thank you for the question. I'd like to uh, begin with the last question. Now we have a plan until the year 2030, and now we are moving ahead. My personal experience uh, uh, prompts me that we need to, uh, to provide for long-term planning. We are number two in the CIS countries. After Kazakhstan, we also adopted a plan for economy in the year until the year 2020. I was one of the uh, authors of these projects. There were some skeptical views in the ministry, and we used their rather rigid uh, uh, rigid uh, lobbying uh, uh, with the Ministry of uh, Education. So as far as the as the, the development of uh, um, ch ch uh, electric, uh, the, uh, the structure of uh, charging electrical uh, facilities. We, we, I talk about electromobiles and things that need to be, uh, whose batteries need to be charged. So, the, the, the one company began the state monopolies, so that was a state concern, so, so there was a special uh, organization which was, uh, um, uh, which was made incumbent to uh, develop these uh, charging structures for batteries, it's number one. Number two, it's, uh, uh, I agree here with my colleagues uh, from Kazakhstan and from other countries that besides macroeconomic stability, we need to have a vision of the, or a political will for the future so that if we want to uh, involve businesses. So now currently we are working and, uh, on the on introduction of uh, uh, the turnover of uh, uh, tear. Of, uh, so that will be, uh, uh, the, yeah, I mean, the uh, uh, glassware, uh, uh, um, the jars and things like this. Uh, so the, for that requires special legislation and that requires also a transition period. Currently we are now at the uh, final stage of development of the legal um, uh, platform for that. So we are preparing our country uh, for the fact that, you know, we will have to pay, I mean the users will have to pay for uh, turnover of the uh, tear. 
knowing that sooner or later the government will uh, announce a competition for the organization of the system. Currently, we know some investors already have emerged. There are four uh, world-famous companies who have expressed a desire to participate in them. So that's how we involve and attract the private company. So maybe you didn't understand me uh, properly. This was the golden dream of the Ministry of Economy so that uh, that the uh, that all the, uh, the uh, uh, these processes should be uh, fully uh, um, uh, uh, mobilized. <laughs> the former minister of minister of trade and uh, other uh, a person who actually is involved in this thing is uh, working quite actively here. Uh, also, uh, our colleagues have been uh, talking about uh, the, uh, the indicators of the uh, uh, SDGs should somehow be compared uh, uh, with the metrics of our economy. And also, we would like to uh, stress here that quite a number of um, uh, activities should be done uh, in our country. So this is the concept of national strategy. Besides that, we say have three working groups that, uh, that uh, by way of dialogue, by, let's say, uh, giving out threats, uh, let's say, in uh, uh, inverted commas, uh, we, uh, so this, these uh, groups uh, are controlled by the uh, interministerial, uh, um, uh, interministerial um, uh, 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 governing uh, entity for um, uh, uh, achieving the uh, uh, SDGs. So this is rather a, an arduous way. Uh, it is not easy. Uh, I have heard what our colleagues said, and I couldn't agree more with them. That this process is rather uh, very difficult. Many countries already have embarked upon this road, and we can now compare our results using the same uniform methodology. Thank you very much for your question. More question or two. There is one here. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, from the Kyrgyz Republic, uh, Prime Minister's office. So I just uh, uh, wanted to share with the information because also I've heard that uh, uh, our uh, colleagues, my colleagues from our neighboring countries, uh, they succeed a lot in uh, those steps of uh, uh, putting on the uh, very high point at the agenda, the uh, issues related to the green economy. So uh, also uh, for the Kyrgyz Republic uh, in uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2019, uh, we have adopted a program for development of the green economy. And in 2018, uh, we have uh, held the green uh, green week uh, uh, in the Kyrgyz Republic, and uh, that's actually a very important issue uh, as related to the issues uh, of harmonizing those programs with the nas national sustainable development strategies. And uh, uh, this uh, program that we have developed. Uh, uh, for the development of green economy, it was full, fully harmonized with uh, our national strategy for 2040 that we have adopted in the Kyrgyz Republic. And uh, uh, this uh, program also was uh, harmonized with our mid-term program for next five years uh, of the Kyrgyz Republic. And one of the main points uh, uh, in uh, those programs as uh, the program of the uh, government of the Kyrgyz Republic for the next five years and uh, this green economy program is uh, the uh, attraction of the private sectors to those issues and uh, as my colleagues also mentioned that uh, PPP actually plays a very significant role in 
uh, those issues and uh, also I wanted to share with uh, some information about uh, some achievements of uh, financing uh, of SDGs through those PPP mechanisms. So uh, in uh, my country we have adopted uh, PPP law in 2016 and uh, only this year, actually, we have uh, the real achievement. I mean, uh, one project was realized uh, together with the uh, uh, IFC. Uh, now we re realize project on these hemodialysis centers uh, in the Kyrgyz Republic. It, it, it was very, uh, I think, significant achievement for the Kyrgyz Republic. So with this PPP mechanism, uh, we have uh, attracted uh, one of the leaders in providing these hemodialysis services. It's a Fresenius medical care company, which is uh, not only a leader in providing hemodialysis services, but also um, a leader in production of uh, sub-materials and, uh, and equipment. Uh, and also we are working now on different other projects uh, on this PPP uh, mechanism. Uh, one, uh, some of those projects related to alternative and uh, renewable energy as a small uh, hydroelectric plants. And uh, I think that this PPP mechanism is very important for, uh, for development of uh, this uh, green economy, for development of uh, uh, issues related to SDGs. And uh, that's just a remark, it's not a uh, question, just uh, uh, some information from the Kyrgyz Republic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, open up for a question or comment. Another one? There is one over there, yeah. Hi, um, thank you. Uh, my name is Ajay, I'm, I, I represent UNOPS. Uh, which is the uh, UN agency with the mandate for project management, infrastructure, and procurement. Um, I have a question for all of the esteemed panelists. Uh, considering that um, all of the esteemed panelists come from a, a region which, in which there is very good implementation and policy capacity, um, I wondered what, what their experience of is working with, um, what their experience is of working with the UN, uh, particularly in the areas um, and particularly in working on implementation of projects with state budget funding. Um, so projects where traditional development finance or ODA is not involved. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take one more if there is any and then we'll get the floor to the speakers. Um, no more comments? So would anybody like to um, answer? Yeah, please. Just a few words. Belarus, we were working generally with the uh, UNEP in the project that is known as an epigram. So the, the, the organization of countries uh, with uh, uh, Eastern Partnership. This is the organization that held up the umbrella, so to speak. There was also Economic Commission of the United Nations, the UNEP, UNIDO, and, uh, and other organizations. These programs, somehow, were implemented via special projects. Moldova was also part of Azerbaijan, Armenia, and there were also private companies. And it's very interesting from the uh, uh, point of view of green economy. I would like to say that UNEP has helped us to uh, work out our national plan. It is the only one, but from the point of view of the government didn't invest a single ruble into it, but the government took a historic uh, decision that uh, this uh, project should be taken as a top priority one and uh, should be. Um, that's how we have been working. Regarding other things, other UN agencies, we have very good uh, relations with the UNIDO uh, and. Uh, we have also created the centers of excellence, uh, and uh, I believe there are uh, a lot of uh, room for development here. 
uh, in this uh, way of circular, circular economy. The United Nations has a number of uh, method, methods which are very interesting for us. So we started a big UNDP project uh, for <coughs> promoting the local development and the, uh, uh, the uh, entrepreneurship of the females uh, is just one of the issues that deserves our particular attention. So it's a project is rather large scale, $62 million for, for this direct financing. It's quite a sizable sum for Belarus. Thank you. Would anybody else in the panel uh, like to respond to this question? Um, I, I really uh, uh, thankful for this question because it's really an opportunity to um, say what's happening in the region. So um, I think our meeting today here really reflects uh, the uh, maybe the nature of this UN regional hub that it's it's really a bridge between Europe and Central Asia. And Central Asia it's really uh, currently in in its very new phase with Uzbekistan being opened up. Uh, and liberalizing uh, its economy, it has a huge potential. It's a region with a uh, very large population. Um, there are differences in economic, institutional, political development in the region, and uh, UN agencies, they were incremental in uh, moving the reforms uh, in the region. In Kazakhstan, we have about 18 uh, agencies and also regional offices for uh, five Central Asia uh, countries in the region. They're mostly based in Almaty, and uh, just recently, last year, uh, last month, sorry, uh, we uh, opened um, the, the <laughs> Kazakhstan, presented a building for the uh, UN agencies, where now all UN uh, regional agencies, as well as uh, which are present on a country level, where they will be residing. And we are, this is, I think, a reflection of uh, the growing importance of SDG agenda, of UN agenda in the world and in, in our region. We are very much interested in uh, and very much keen on uh, helping uh, all the countries in the region to integrate more closely and really uh, have a spillover effects from the best practices that we have. Uh, in our economies, and today we've been sharing a lot of these best practices, and uh, I was really uh, amazed to see the progress uh, in our neighboring countries and in the region. We uh, very uh, we, we believe that uh, this uh, regional integration uh, and uh, building um, a level playing field for the countries in terms of institutions, uh, certain rules. Uh, and uh, targets as well as principles which we, we see in SDG uh, agenda, they are very important uh, for, for the future of the region, for sustainable development of the region. Uh, Kazakhstan has a certain uh, areas where it can maybe share, where it have achieved some better results to this moment, which does not mean that we will not be overpassed by other countries and would be happy to see uh, the progress in uh, other countries. We have a regional hub, for example, for civil service, the, the head of this hub also with us today, uh, where we uh, shared our experiences on civil service. We've been commanded a lot for achieving a good results in public service uh, and the civil service improvement. Uh, another reform that, was, uh, that changed a lot in Kazakhstan uh, with the support of UN was um, RBB introduction in Kazakhstan. We did RBB with the World Bank, we started with the World Bank, but then there was uh, a, a, a project uh, for about 300, 400 thousand dollars for each year with 10% being financed from UN, the rest by the government, uh, for, it ran for about five to six years where we uh, changed the system of strategic planning so I was responsible for that at the Ministry of National Economy, so I know that very well. We changed all the strategic uh, programs, national programs. We introduced key indicators, uh, KPIs, and we changed the budget programs. So it, it's not line budgeting, but for now, five years now, we have a new uh, budget programs where you have a clear link between your target strategic goal and you have a clear link with your KPI in your budget program. Uh, 
uh, we currently doing it on a regional level, we did it on a central level, uh, we do an implementation on a regional level. Another great, there are lots of examples, I mean, 18 agencies are there and lots, lots been uh, done and lots of, uh, lots of stories, experiences to share, but another great example which is currently uh, evolving and uh, is in the face of implementation in Kazakhstan is a uh, uh, support uh, we are getting from UN Women on gender equality uh, and gender agenda. It's uh, becoming uh, at the top of agenda in Kazakhstan as well as we are becoming closer with OECD and we signed OECD declaration on gender rights uh, in gender equality in uh, public sector and uh, economy and business. Uh, we, uh, ha we signed uh, a special project uh, two years ago on gender budgeting um, and uh, introducing gender indicators in our strategic programs. Uh, there was a lot of work that was done on raising awareness about gender budgeting. So two years ago, you would ask someone, they would not know even like, what is the gender budgeting, right? Uh, I, I have the same parallel, I think, with the, the development finance, the topic we've been discussing a lot, that we need to put the same maybe amount of pressure and methodology, me, me, uh, support methodologically in implementing uh, some indicators, some mechanisms uh, of sustainable finance mm -hmm. in our uh, budget system. The same way, likewise, we are doing for gender budgeting now. Uh, and uh, not only on gender budgeting, but now we are in a big, prog uh, big project on uh, fighting domestic violence uh, and economic empowerment of women, especially in rural areas. And these are the, the two issues that are quite uh, important uh, for uh, not only for Kazakhstan, but for Central Asia regions where the role of women was been anyway uh, not that well uh, promoted over the past years. Uh, Kazakhstan with 67% of women participation, 50% of SMEs being owned or led by women uh, is in a quite good position, but still there are areas where we can uh, improve, but also lots of already uh, uh, experiences which we can share. And uh, uh, I think uh, the, when UN looks at our countries, it should, it should think regionally and uh, think how we can better um, make this good spillover effects happen for our countries. Thank you. Thank you. I see Mr. Rashrafanov. Did you want to intervene? Yeah. I would like to, say, I would like to thank UN for its active role in Uzbekistan because uh, we are now, right now, uh, after uh, introdu introduction of this comprehensive action strategy for the years 2017 and 21. We are working together and closely with all the UN offices uh, presented in Uzbekistan. Uh, will be, for example, on tourism side, or will be on a transport and logistic side. And uh, I would like to stress out here the UNDP and UNICEF, because with the UNDP, who was active uh, uh, when uh, we were drafting the budget code, and it was really big achievement for Uzbekistan that now we have new budget code we are working since five, uh, five years ago it was adopted and uh, developed and adopted thanks to uh, UNDP and for the UNICEF right now we are working on the huge now uh, project project on setting the social safety net so and uh, setting the uh, single uh, registry for in Uzbekistan and this uh, project I think will be uh, one of the huge projects which will bring the social protection and the registration of all the employees on, and, on the, and, and, the, and the citizens of Uzbekistan. And with the UNDP also we are working right now for SDG, SDGs and we are already talking uh, on bringing some consultants and bringing some advisors on the uh, very innovative uh, options fi on financing. financing like green options and, and social, uh, green bonds and social bonds. And I hope that will be what uh, Matilda can, uh, 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 we were working with the, uh, uh, Matilda, Matilda's office in Uzbekistan on this and we'll be working closely with them. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I think this has been a very uh, rich uh, conversation full of uh, specific examples. Uh, and uh, so I would like to thank the, the panelists. I would ask you to give an applause to our panelists for this uh, very good conversation. So Ali Khan.